After watching a bunch of Nurbert Fallout runs and watching The Mandalorian for the hundredth time, I decided to see if I can beat Fallout 3 as the Mando. Hi, I'm a pastry that's been cursed with sentience. Let's see how this run plays out. And be sure to stick around to the end for a nice little treat. As with all cosplay runs, we need some ground rules. First, I have to find and wear a helmet, and I am not allowed to remove it, for this is the way. Secondly, I have to look and act like Din Djarin as closely as the game allows. Thirdly, and finally, the man will never use drugs, so let's never use them. That includes stim packs and right away. Doctors healing me with them though is perfectly fine. With those rules out of the way, let's take a look at the character. Just kidding, he's going to be wearing a helmet for the entire run. Or he would be wearing a helmet if the game didn't remove it on me. For special stats, I went with 5 in strength, as even though he's proficient with his fists and melee weapons, there are stronger fish out there in the sea, as seen in Chapter 7. 8 in perception, as he's quite perceptive. 9 in endurance, as we see him take several hits and get back up again. 5 in charisma, which will later be boosted to 6 with the bobblehead. We've seen that he's quite the animal handler in Chapter 9. 5 in intelligence, as I figured he's about average. 7 in agility, as he can draw his weapons quickly, and 1 in luck, as he relies on his skills. Flash forward a few years, and it's time for my GOAT test, or the Generalized Occupational Aptitude Test test, where I tagged my skills. Energy weapons, melee weapons, and repair. I went with these, as Mando is proficient with his blaster, his spear and knife, and I assumed he'd be good at maintaining them. On the way, I did Why teach me? Butch and his cute little gang a lesson, as that is something that Mando would do. Please, Even without putting fighting. points into the unarmed skill, and having an average amount of strength, Mando is still able to take on three people. Get, come on. Flash forward a few more years, and my dad is dead. I mean, has here. escaped. Your dad is gone, this isn't Star Wars. Yet. Turns out the Overseer has it out for me, as he has already murdered Jonas, since he helped my dad escape. Amada tries to give me a gun, but I refuse. Even though the 10mm is competent, it isn't a blaster, and my fists are more than good enough. Though, if you're playing at home, taking the 10mm would also be acceptable, as weapons are part of Mando's religion. Coming across the Overseer, we see Amada use the 10mm to grant her freedom. I do spare the Overseer for the time being, as I don't think Mando would murder someone in cold blood. And I did also save Butch's mother. Even though Butch was a bully, the Mando would still lend a helping hand. With all of that out of the way, it's time to escape. With my newfound freedom, it's high time that I find some bounties to collect. The Sheriff wants the bomb in the middle of his town to be disarmed. While shopping at Moira's, she tells me that she's writing a book and needs a field researcher since, why not get paid for getting shot at? Lucy Evan pulls me aside to give me a quest. This is what happens when you enter a pub in an RPG. You are just blasted with quests. She wants me to deliver a letter to her family as even though the USPS will deliver in any weather, they haven't been around for a few centuries. But the motto is here. Bounty hunter, father figure, taxi driver, letter carrier. No job is beneath Mando. Mr. Burke has a proposition for me that I can refuse. I politely tell him where he can stuff his caps. And while I was back in Megaton to restock my ammo, I also helped Walter with his leaky pipe problem. I finally meet Moriarty, Irish guy who owns a pub. Such a good stereotypical character. He has information on my father's whereabouts, which I begrudgingly buy. But first, let's explore the super duper mart. Which I'm glad I did, because not only is there a blaster, there is a second one for me to repair with. It was conveniently close to the fridge full of food that I needed for Moira. I get to the back of the store and completely forgot how to open this door. Turns out I had the key with me the entire time. The Mando might have 9 perception, but I have minus 1. My reward for finding all those drugs and food? A food sanitizer that increases the amount of health I gain from food. Incredibly useful for this run. With the adventure in Super Duper Mount finished, I now go to find Dad. But first, I explore Vault 108 for the Charisma Bobblehead. This will come in use later on, as I need 6 Charisma for the Animal Friend perk. Now I go find my dad by making my way downtown to face off against my first batch of Super Moonies. I was a little scared, 
So I threw a few frag grenades and nearly blew myself up in the process. This caused my right arm to get broken, the first broken limb in the run. Unfortunately, I cannot sleep it off because this very rude dead knight takes up the entire bed roll. Thankfully, an Empire Light Patrol was in the neighborhood and they helped me out against the rest of the super mutants, which was great because I could not shoot straight. But they weren't a great help against the behemoth, resulting in my first dust of the run. I then met the man of the hour, unfortunately, and learned he will only give me the information I need if I do a quest for him. And so begins the Wasteland's Golden Rule. I heard that there were hot single potatoes in my neighborhood just waiting to be picked up, but it was a trap to get sniped by an old man, just like in real life. Don't ask how I know that. Myra though is impressed and gives me schematics for bottle cap mines and a couple of fragmentation grenades. Her next research point is the effects of radiation. Good thing there's a nuke in the middle of town that's irradiated the water surrounding it. While near Erefu, I go and drop off Lucy's letter to her family and oh god they're all dead. Turns out some raiders have been pestering them, so Evan Keen, the mayor of the town, has me hunt them down. And I find them, and they are vampires. I mean cannibals. Turns out Ian, Lucy's brother, is also a vampire. I mean cannibal. And he was the one that murdered his parents because he developed the urges, as Vance puts it. Ian's in isolation, which I end early as his sister understands him. Maybe she too is a vampire. I mean cannibal. Returning to Vance, I inform him that Ian is going back to his sister. But I do manage to broker a peace treaty between Erufu and the vampires. I mean cannibals. Something that Evan is most thankful for. Next topic for Moira's Wastelander Survival Guide, Mole Rats. While on the way to the sewers, I encounter a Wastelander who is being held captive by some super mutants. After some slashing with my knife, the Wastelander is now free. As for the Mole Rats, Moira wasn't impressed, but still gives me some emotional support drugs for my troubles. The rest of chapter 2 involves me putting a tracker in some Mirelurk eggs and getting seriously injured, but I became distracted. Again. As I went and grabbed the satellite part that 3Dog, who named themselves that, was asking for. He points me to Rivet City, where I was just buying ammo. I swear. Well, I meet Dr. Lee, and she gives me the location of where my dad went off to. It seems he's always just one step in front of me at all times. But before I head off to find dad, I did swing by Underworld where I find an unconscious Riley. Using the good old fashioned duct tape the bones back together technique, she regains consciousness. Remember, if they don't find you handsome, they should at least find you handy. I am now tasked with rescuing the rest of her rangers. Her team is pinned on the top of the Statesman Hotel, and the place is crawling with soup mutants and centaurs. You know, I always wondered what centaurs are. Turns out, the super mutants wanted to see what happens when a bunch of people are submerged in the green stuff. That. That is what you get. Well, several stairs climbed, several super mutants slain, and I reach her team, and we all escape. I love it when a plan comes together. I return with the good news. There, I receive the first part of my kit, Ranger Armor. The best non-power armor armor a Mando can have. I will pass this down for generations to come. Which got me thinking about the rest of my kit. I head to a mysterious outcast base and agree to enter a simulation for them. My reward? Whatever is in the armory. The simulation is the retaking of Anchorage, Alaska from the invading Chinese forces. It was basically playing Call of Duty Modern Warfare. The 2007 version. Upon exiting the simulation, my helmet is mysteriously missing. Hmm. Oh well. I head to the armory and get my prizes. One Gauss rifle. This will do nicely as a substitute for Mando's Ambon Phase Pulse Blaster. A trench knife as an upgrade to the combat knife. And one dark saber that I never use. I may have beaten its previous wielder in one-on-one -on -one combat, but that was just a simulation. I highly doubt the Mandalorians would recognize me for such a petty achievement. My reward angers a few of the outcast members, so they start a blasting. Let's see the firepower of the Gauss Rifle. It too shots them, you say? This will do nicely. And would you look at that? Everyone who saw me without my helmet on is dead. With my new kit, let's finish up Morrow's book. 
The first order of business, planting a tracker in a bunch of eggs. The next task was to get injured. Should be easy enough. Just toss a frag grenade at my feet and... You know, I forgot that the ranger armor is really good. Either that or explosive suck in Fallout 3. The last chapter involves learning a bit about Rivet City history, heading up a library and shooting robots. Interrogating, I mean interviewing, the residents of Rivet City, I learned that Pinkerton has been here the longest. And conveniently has done facial reconstruction surgery on an android. I should have mentioned that pages ago, but Zimmerman wanted me to find his pet android, which I did. Why did I not turn him in? Mando can smell a hut when he smells one, and he went side with them, even if it means siding with the droid. Then it's off to the best place in the world, the library. It's great. It has books. Baseball. Though the batter seems to be rushing the pitcher. Lastly, Mando visits a Robco facility to plug in an unknown USB drive to see what happens. What could possibly go wrong? The droids wake up. That's why. Oh well, at least I get some free target practice out of it. With Moira's book out of the way, I yep. finally remember the about the princess in her tower that I need to rescue. One uneventful trip to Vault 112, I don their jumpsuit with my helmet on and enter hell. Suburban America. Though, to be fair, everywhere is within walking distance, and because of the lack of traffic, pedestrians can move where they please. Mano meets Betty, an avatar of Dr. Braun. Mano doesn't play his, her, game, and learns from Old Lady Deathers where the simulation terminal is. Also, why is she named Old Lady Deathers? I wonder if that's her real name. Anyway, code entered. Failsafe triggered, and Dr. Braun is trapped in a nightmare of his own making. Exit the pod, and my helmet is missing. This is the second time game. Thankfully, the only person who sees me without my helmet isn't long for this world. Oh, spoilers! Before I can go to Rivet City, Mando is once again distracted. Brian has an ant problem. The problem can be traced back to a mad scientist who enlarged the ants for reasons and in doing so, gave them flamethrowers. No, great, just what ants need. Well, Queen Ant Guardian slain, and a very angry queen after me, I returned to Brian to deliver the good news. He has me go to his aunt in Rivet City to see if he can stay with her, which I do, then completely forget to inform Brian about it for the rest of the run. I did visit a comic book headquarters. I came here to learn the history of the Antagonizer, an orphan who turned to crime to make ends meet but she doesn't need to continue this path. This information was especially useful to the real-life antagonizer, an orphan who identified with the comic book version. She, of course, stands down because she decided that, like the antagonizer, to put her life of crime behind her and use her skills to help others. I tell the mechanist that the antagonizer is no more and put him out of his misery. He was creating droids and sicking them on the capital wasteland, something that Mando can't stand. He didn't drop his unique laser pistol, but I don't think it would be a good option, as it was more of a laser shotgun. Back at Rivet City, where I was restocking supplies, I come across Abraham, who wants me to reenact my favorite Nicolas Cage movie. You at the archives, I find another Nicolas Cage fan, Sydney. No we fight our way through a bunch of droids, where I come across a droid with delusions of being Bud and Gwyneth, who has been dead for 500 years. Why didn't I blast him on the spot? He convinced me by having me go to my favorite place in the whole world. He is a good egg in my book. With my distractions out of the way, for now, it was time to help Dad get Project Purity back up and running. This catches the eye of the Empire, and they are the ones that correct the timeline. I love it when nature heals. Well, the scientists and Mano escape. Mano gives five of his emotional support stim packs to Garza, and we go into the loving arms of the Empire Light. Oh boy. Unfortunately, I have to work with them. They do give me the location of the MacGuffin. On the way to the MacGuffin, I get abducted by aliens. Even when I am not getting distracted, the game goes out of its way to ensure that I do get distracted. Here we meet Soma, who has a brilliant plan to break out of prison. We fight each other. 
This somehow works. I get my equipment back, and a new blaster. The Alien Atomizer. It's no IB-94, but it is from a galaxy far, far away. Now, you might be thinking that Soma saw me without my helmet, which she did, but I'm pretty sure she dies because I never see her again, so it all works out in the end. With the new blaster in hand, Soma and I find a samurai, a cowboy, an American soldier, and a dead astronaut. They now have me clear the rest of the spaceship. As this is a video game, there are three areas. The first area is pretty cool. The second area was a nerd's favorite. That nerd was me. And the final area, well, well, it exists. With the three areas clear, the rest of the gang gain control of the ship. Just in time, as we get to fight another spaceship, it was riveting gameplay of pressing one button and waiting for it to reset. On my way home to stash myself, I received a radio message from Amada stating that the vault needs help. The Overseer has gone on a power trip, causing a civil war within the vault. The Overseer's group wants to permanently lock down the vault, letting no one in or out, not even for expeditions. Amada's group wants to open the vault up to traders. Searching around the vault, I discover that a few of the Overseer's guards want to do a night raid on the rebel base room to teach them a lesson. Bringing this to the attention of the Overseer, he steps down and passes command off to Mata. Such a democratic solution. This permanently kicks me out of the vault. Which is great, as I can now go to Little Lamplight to progress the main story. Right after I help Agatha, the sweetest old lady in the capital waste, find a sweet Stradivarius. It was in Vault 92, a vault designed to test subliminal messaging. Turns out, the lead researcher didn't know about the nefarious aspects of the experiment. After returning the authentic violin, I now finally reached Little Lamplight. All that stood between me and the entrance was McCready. I was sweating bullets, as I didn't have the child at heartbreak, and I did not want to get even more sidetracked. This run was already long enough as it is, but with one luck and a dream, I somehow oh, managed no. to pass a 34% chance oh, speech okay. check. Be well, bang bang boom, I am now in Vault 87 looking for the Gek. I do discover a new friend who was more than willing to grab it for me. Good thing, as it was surrounded by radiation. Now, just to return to Empire Light. Oh god, my eyes. Once I regain my sight, I find myself imprisoned by the Empire. At their base. The only thing that would be worse for them is if they let me free and left all my gear within arm's reach. Well, they absolutely failed at rule number two. Rule number one is don't let Luke Skywalker anywhere near an Empire base. I do get to meet their leader, President Eden, and I managed to convince him to self-destruct. A perfect end to a droid. After escaping, I find that Fox, my new best friend, was trying to spring me from prison after knowing me for only three minutes. Everyone needs a friend like Fox. Fox and I head back to Empire Light, informing them of the actions of the Empire. They then bring out the largest droid known to man, the capitalism propaganda robot. Unfortunately, I cannot kill this droid. We escort, or more accurately, are escorted by the capitalism propaganda robot to Project Purity. In there, we have a boss fight with Colonel Autumn. I say fight, but I've been too shot in Enclave Power Armor Soldiers, though he did take it like a champ. I then enter the code, thankfully I remembered it, and finished the game, but not the run. I wake up two weeks later. Thankfully, Mando is a man, so it was his plot armor that saved his bacon. The Empire Light informs me that there are Imperial Remnants still out there. Reaching the location of the first encampment, Empire Light brings the capitalism propaganda robot to punch a hole in the defenses of the Empire before being obliterated by the Death Star laser. My only regret is that it wasn't I that killed the oversized droid. Maybe one day I'll be given an opportunity. With the location of the Death Star laser in hand, Paladin Tristan wants me to search an old power facility. It was invested with Death Claws. So many. Death Claws. And the Tesla coil nearly killed me, because my natural one perception made me miss the emergency turnoff lever. Time to storm the Adams Air Force Base with Baby Yoda. Empire Light drops off a new weapon from the Tesla coil. The Tesla Cannon. 
which I immediately ditch as I have not been investing into the big gun skill. We clear the rest of the facility and find the fire control terminal to target itself, forward a vertebrate, and fly to within minimum safe distance to watch the fireworks as the Death Star laser destroys itself. Scanning the radio, Mando receives a distress call from far up north. Werner is an escaped slave from the hut space, and wants to employ me to free the rest of them. I'm definitely the man for the job. The only hitch, I need to disguise myself as a slave, which makes me take off my helmet. It's fine, because the ones who see me without my helmet aren't long for the world. Nah, technically the run fails. So there you go, run over. But let's continue on, as we're almost done. Well, the disguise works so well, as I am immediately stripped of all of my gear. Great. This is the second time this happened in this run, and I am given the task of finding steel ingots in the steel yard. This place is where I am introduced to the DLC's newest enemy, frogs. I mean trogs. You'd think this would be a problem, as I can't use anything from the DLC, and all of my guns are gone. But I've been investing in the unarmed skill, and I now had paralyzing palm. Yeah, they weren't much of an issue. With the steel ingots collected, I am granted access to the hut's arena. Thankfully, it's just their champions, and not a rancor. The biggest threat of the arena were not the champions, but the radiation barrels, as it put a time limit on the fight. Winning the challenge grants me audience with Asher Hut, where he offers me the opportunity to join him. During the negotiations, the slaves start attacking, which allows me to conveniently steal the baby. I don't feel like the good guy here. Well, that sets off the rest of the raiders, and they start shooting me. That's okay, as I have a bunch of slayers backing me up. Meeting up with Werner, he now has me go to the power plant to disable the floodlights protecting the city from the frogs. I mean trogs. Coming out of the sewers, I confront Asher Hut. He didn't have a leg in the race. With the rest of the Hut forces defeated, the trogs subdued, the slaves are now free. After all the fun of spearheading a slave revolution, destroying a Death Star, and being massively disappointed in not killing the biggest droid this side of the galaxy, I think Mano deserves a vacation. I heard that Naboo is nice this time of year. Oh gosh darn it. Mano is approached by Catherine, and she wants me to find her daughter, who has gone to Naboo to seek riches through adventures and looting the Verakino. Mano accepts, and it looks like the vacation will have to wait. The Verakino is currently under occupation by Desmond, a rich squatter, and he has been attacked by a bunch of locals. I have no clue why. Afterwards, Desmond wants me to go to church to try and infiltrate the locals. The locos want me to do a ritual by ingesting Pungo seed pods. Ingesting these pods has Mano go on a trip. There's a lot of sawing noises, and nuclear quantum bottles exploding in baby cries. Totally normal. I then wake up to a bunch of blowflies shooting me with their stainers, and soon discover that my hair has been shaved off, and there is a new scar. Like but this gains me access to the church, where I find Nadine, Catherine's daughter. She suspects something is up, and wants me to find the leader of the group. I then inform Desmond, who berates me for not taking the initiative, which is fair. Jackson, the leader of the group, is in a cave filled with swamp water. Perfectly normal. The higher being that he's been taking orders from is conveniently an old enemy of Desmond, Professor Culver. I, of course, don't side with the old enemy, and help Desmond by jamming Calvert's broadcaster. After a brief scrap with the locals, I return to find that the Verakino can fly now. This pisses off Desmond, not because the Verakino is no longer in Naboo. No, it killed his two dogs. The unfortunate circumstance did lead us to Professor Calvert's lair. John Wick and I clear it, which was a treat, as it was full of droids and I put a few bullets into Calvert's brain casing. Returning to the riverboat to head back to the capital waste, I find Nadine is now the captain of this mighty vine vessel. Turns out, the previous captain was the one who took a bit of my brain. I have a nice chat with him. Partly because he took my brain, but mostly because he saw me without my helmet. I could not let that stand. It was nice to return to follow through, especially as Mando. This playthrough reminded me why I spent several hundred hours in this game back in 2009. And it was nice to finally play the DLCs, as I never got around to it back when they first released. 
and my first playthrough through the DLCs as Mano was quite the treat. And I want to personally thank you for watching my little adventure through Fallout 3. Your support is greatly appreciated. And as always, I'm rooting for you. We're all in this together. You know, I heard there are several bounties on the west coast. Maybe I should go collect them. From where you're kneeling must seem like an 18 karat run of bad luck. Truth is, the game was rigged from the start. <laughs>